Hello, I'm Adria Maury of Dre Renee Knits, and this is a little weekly podcast where I answer some of your questions. This week I am once again wearing broom because it is just that stinking comfortable. Plus, I changed midway last week and really wore the silvery whitish gray one, so I felt like I could get away with wearing the teal one <laughs> for the full episode this week. Um, this is knit up in Farmer's Daughter Fibers O-Dang DK, and I love it. You, If you're interested to hear more about the yarn, subbing for yarn, my two versions, etc., go ahead and watch last week's episode, episode 162, because I did a deep dive for the first half of that episode. <laughs> um, so let's just go ahead and jump into some questions. Question number one. Um, my question today is about your Wandering Whips videos. How do you record them? They look so good on Instagram. When I've tried to do it, they're always crooked or I drop my phone and give up. <laughs> Any tips or tool suggestions would be awesome. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I have my giant thing of water here. Okay. I am pretty sure I actually was talking to Spicy Pete earlier today and was like, didn't we record a video behind the scenes of showing how I do this? And I think we did. I think we forgot about it. So I'm going to look. And if we did, I'll post a reel to Instagram. But, and if not, I'll try and get one recorded so you can see. As you all know, if you've been watching this podcast for any length of time, but especially if you watched it in the early days, I used to prop my phone on a bookshelf. Sometimes it would fall down during the episode and I would just keep going and prop it back up. So I tend to be very, very low tech and that goes for my little walking and knitting videos as well. I literally just prop my phone <laughs> here. <laughs> so since I started recording those, it was always chilly enough out that I've been wearing some kind of zip up something. Usually I have a jacket that I wear on most of my walks and it does have a high neck on it with a zipper. So usually what I do is I unzip it to about here and I prop my phone and then I zip it back up a little bit to hold it steady. It does fall out sometimes. The nice thing is, is with if I, if I'm recording on my phone otherwise, I would try and show you. But um, the nice thing is too, with iPhone at least, it's the only phone I know, but the cameras have come such a long way in cell phones. So it stabilizes your image. So like I just did one this week, a couple days ago, and I only had a hoodie on and that was not as stable as my jacket, but I still managed to do it. I had to walk a little slower. But I mean, it's right here. And it was definitely like, -da 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 -da. I walked and I was like, oh, this might be a throwaway. I don't, it might be too jostly. But it's amazing how much that it, st it ends up stabilizing the video. Um, so it was still usable, I think. Um, but yeah, I literally prop it. And I think it's easiest with something with a zip so you can kind of shove it down and then kind of zip a little more to secure it. But sometimes it'll go like this. <laughs> flip up into me just looking at the sky sometimes I realize my hands are too far over I mean it's very low tech it's not perfect there are all kinds of gadgets you can buy for these things that go around your neck and actually hold your phone so if you want to not fiddle like I do <laughs> If you want something that'll just work, um, then you could go that route. I've attempted one when I was doing more of those videos. I was like, oh, this could be fun to try. Totally. It was like one of those ads that pops up into your feed. I didn't love it. I found that the thing is, is these phones are so heavy. And in the videos, they look awesome. But I found that this camera could barely hold the weight of the phone. So it would start to tilt. And that kind of stuff drives me nuts. So anyways, I used it like twice. I should try it again. Maybe there's some, I don't know if there's areas I could tighten on it. I'll have to look. But there are gadgets like that out there for sure. So you can always go that route. All right. Next question is a Hashimoto's question. 
I just found out last October that I have Hashimoto's. Um, it seems like knitting helped me to keep my sanity, which I learned in 2019 when I knit a baby blanket for my last child and probably developed this disease. I just want to know what knitting has done for you through your health journey. I often see it mentioned as a great hobby to pick up for those dealing with autoimmune disease as it gives you something to focus on rather than on your health issue. Would you say this has been a source of comfort for you during this time in your life? Um, absolutely. And I think it goes, so for anybody who doesn't know, Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disorder that primarily affects the thyroid. It comes with a whole host of symptoms that can vary depending on each individual. I got diagnosed, geez, I think at least six years ago. It does seem to be common that it pops up for women um, after they've had kids. I have heard that about a lot of autoimmune disorders. Um, but so I think knitting, regardless of if you're dealing, what you're dealing with in life, um, knitting is so meditative and relaxing. Um, it definitely can be a distraction. I also think that it just helps unlock kind of that same part of our brain as meditation does with its rhythm. So I think it can be really helpful. The great thing in regards to health that I have found with knitting is, and again, I think this goes for autoimmune disorders and every, everything else, all the health issues, is stress. They have found place such a huge factor in our health. And a lot of us with autoimmune disorders can kind of take, how do I want to say this? Um, relate it to stressful events in our life or ongoing stress, whether it be physical or mental. Um, so I think one of the key things that knitting and other crafts do for us is it helps reduce our stress. And when we reduce our stress, we have a better chance of healing and supporting our health. And even if you're perfectly healthy, um, it's just a great way to keep stress in check and to decompress. It's a great time to let your mind wander. I really feel that way about spinning as well. Um, if you do need a distraction, I think crafts can be great for that as well. I find that more in sewing than I might in, well, it depends. I guess it depends on my project, but sewing for me, I get so focused because um, I really have to pay attention to each step and it, the steps you're constantly jumping from step to step. So it's like, I have to iron, now I have to sit down and sew, now I need to iron again, now I need to do this. You know, there's a lot of like, boop, boop, boop. So I get really focused on that. So that can be a great, when you just need your, a break from maybe the hamster wheel that's going on up here, um, where I feel like for me personally, knitting and spinning get me into that meditative place where I can just kind of get into the zone. Um, and I think my experience too has been things that are tactile can kind of help calm me. I love when I can combine it with getting outside. Getting outside can really reduce our stress. Um, I've read things where they've talked about how our the chemicals in our brain shift when we get outside and into nature. So anyways, yeah, absolutely. I think that knitting and other hobbies can be such a great way to support yourself in all of life. The other thing that I love is whether it is the highs or the lows of life, we lock those moments in with our knitting a lot of times you might go back to a project and you remember that part of what was going on in your life at the time or even sometimes i'll be like oh my gosh this is when i was like reading that one book or watching that one show like it brings back this mess this memory um so it can also be a beautiful way to kind of document your life and what you're going through at that time and again i think it can be for the celebrations or for you know sad or difficult times in our life so absolutely i think it's a great just a great way to support ourselves. And good luck on your health journey. Next question is about holding yarns together. So we have chatted about this one, but it was ages ago and I wanted to revisit it. So I am. Okay, holding yarns together, both the same yarns and different yarns to make a new weight yarn. I've been trying to figure this out and it's just not something I'm grasping. If I want to create a worsted weight yarn, what combos would I hold together? Same with bulky. I've seen blog posts on a formula, but it's not making sense at all. 
So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I wrote out what has kind of like worked for me in the past to get to certain weights by combining yarns. So that's what I'm going to, I'm going to put it in the show notes below. I'm going to read through them now as well so that you could just listen if you just want to listen, but they will be in the show notes and you can play around a try. I mean, at the end of the day, one thing that's going to be important is if you're trying to hit a specific gauge, you'll still, you'll need to swatch and you might need to play with needle size. And remember, you want to try and come up with a fabric you like. So all those things are important factors. So sometimes it's about playing and experimenting, but here is a place to start so that then you can kind of try and see. The other caveat I want to give is not all yarn weights are created equal. So one yarn maker's sport weight might be another yarn maker's fingering weight might be another yarn maker's DK. I mean, there's a general guideline there, but I have found in my 20 odd years of knitting that it can kind of be all over the place. So this again is a great place to start, but your unique yarn that you're using and the ones you want to combine might end up giving you a slightly different weight. I have also found, like I talked about last week with this sweater, that what that yarn's made of is also gonna play a role because some yarns have more of a tendency to bloom or like plump up after they're blocked compared to other yarns that really barely change. So again, here's a place to start and then experiment from there and see works best, what works best for you. All right, so let's start with the ones you asked about. How about? So you wanted to know about bulky, I would hold two strands of worsted together to get a bulky yarn. Um, unless you wanna get more, so I find that the bulkies and the chunkies are kind of one of those ones that can be all over the place. So if you want more of like an Aran weight yarn, so here's how I think of yarn weights personally. Lace, fingering, sport, DK, worsted, Aran, chunky or bulky, super chunky or super bulky. So if I wanted to get a chunky yarn, I or a bulky yarn, I wanna use the word you use so I don't confuse you, bulky, then I would do the two strands of worsted. If you want something more heavier than a worsted but not quite bulky, more of an Aran weight, then I would do two strands of DK. And what was the other one you had asked about? Oh, if you want to create a worsted weight yarn, then that would be, um, two strands of sport weight would get you close to the um, worsted. You could also try a sport in a DK or a lace in a DK or a fingering in a DK. I know those are all quite different, but it really depends on the yarn and what you can achieve. Okay, so now I'm just going to go top to bottom. If I wanted to get a fingering weight, I could hold two strands of lace. If I held one strand of lace weight yarn and one strand of fingering weight yarn, that would give me between a heavy fingering weight and a sport weight. Um, again, it depends on like I've seen lace, yarns labeled as lace that are everything from kind of cobweb lace to some of like the fuzzy yarns I've seen that are listed as a lace weight, but they can really be used knitted as a sport fingering or a sport weight even, depending on how you're using them, what needle size you're doing, etc. So that's why I'm giving a little range and a lot of these. Two strands of fingering weight is going to get you to a, between a sport weight and a DK. One strand of lace or fingering plus one strand of sport is going to get you about a DK. Two strands of sport, DK to worsted. Two strands of DK, Aaron. Two strands of worsted would be about a chunky, and two strands of Aran would be around a super bulky. So again, this is going to be below. It's a great place to get you started. You can also, again, and it sounds like you have done this, but anyone else watching, you can definitely look up some charts on kicking around the internet. Um, there's tons out there. I know that I've even seen them like specific to certain yarn companies who know their yarns well, and they like to combine them. Um, but I love combining yarns and I think it's so interesting because there are a lot of factors that are going to go into what that final yarn weight ends up being. So what your yarn's made of, 
how many strands you're holding together. And I'm really only talking here about holding basically two strands together. I mean, sky's the limit. You can hold three strands together. You can do what you want. So this is just, again, the foundation. Um, but also needle size is obviously going to be the other big thing to play a role in that. Always make sure that when you're experimenting and playing, I highly recommend doing a decent size swatch and washing it, blocking it, letting it dry, and then measuring and see where you're at with your gauge. So I hope that helps get you started. Next question. You have inspired me to branch out and try spinning on a support spindle, and I'm curious what equipment or to tools you use to transfer your singles to bobbins for applying or finishing. So I actually brought mine over so I can show you. I did want to start by saying you don't have to use any tools if you don't want to. You can literally wind those singles onto your thumb to start creating like a center pole ball and you can create what's called plying balls. So you can choose how you wanna do this. Let's say you are working with one support spindle. So you need to keep emptying it to be able to have singles to ply together. What I would do is I would wind them off either on my thumb or onto a Nosta pin, which I usually, oh, just looks like this. I like to wind it onto here because then I don't cut off the circulation on my thumb because no matter how hard I try, I will end up doing it too tight and like the tip of my thumb turns purple and then you have to try and get it off over your knuckle. So a Nosta pin can be a handy tool. I got mine when I was in Australia and I love finding crafting tools like this as souvenirs when I travel because sometimes you don't need maybe any more yard or what have you and something like this can be really special so anyways that's a Nosta pin and you would wind it around here and you would keep doing that until you have if you want to make a two ply or three ply let's say you want to make a three ply you would then have three little balls you can ply from there if you do you need something to kind of trap those little balls so that you can pull to do your plying without them rolling all over the place. So different things you could do would be to use like an old shoe box, cut a hole in the top so that the single can feed through while keeping your yarn ball below. I mean, again, you can probably search this and you'll see all kinds of things that people have done. Um, you could even, if you did it on here, I bet you could then, because it'll leave a hole in that little ball. So one thing you could do is when you're sliding it off of here, if you have like a lazy Kate, you could slide it onto the dowel of the lazy Kate so that your little ball's on there. But it can be a little tricky if you put all three of your little balls that you're plying from in a shoe box and try and go that route, they might tingle around each other. So an extra step that a lot of spindle spinners will do is they will create a plying ball where they are going to wrap all of their plies together into a big ball. And then they're going to apply from that. So all your plies are already together and then you're going to apply from that. I have not personally plied onto a support spindle. The only time I have plied on a spindle was using a drop spindle. So I plied onto um, a drop spindle. And I think, I think for that one, I was even doing sampling. So I did a center pole ball where I pulled from the center of the ball and the outside. And that was my two ply. So that's an option too. Now, I tend to like to make quite... I like to make a decent amount of yarn so that I know I have enough for whatever project I want to do. So my favorite method, that's not saying you can't do that with the other methods. This is just my favorite method, is to transfer everything onto weaving bobbins. This is a weaving bobbin. It is just this little, they can be wood, they can be plastic, they are fairly inexpensive. Um, so what I do is I, I also, I'm a very, very novice weaver. So I already had this set up. So bonus for that is that I already had it. So that also made it really accessible for me. Um, but I then, this is a bobbin winder. And again, you can find these at different price points. I loved that this one was all metal. Um, but this clamps on, I have it clamped over on my shelves over there. You pop your empty bobbin on, 
and then hold your single on there for a minute to get it started and you just wind the single onto there. Now you can do this in different ways. One way is to simply hold your filled up spindle. Woo! Your filled up spindle nose towards it as it's winding. And so you would just kind of hold it and you're winding. So remember, this is on here. <laughs> it's like I need to get, so you would, let's say this is like this. I would be holding this like this and going like this and letting it feed on back and forth. So that is one option. I have a friend who that's how they transfer it all and it works great. Otherwise, I have, I picked this up at Rhinebeck last year and because I did, I, I struggled. That was one of the learning curves for me when I started spindle spinning was getting the singles off of the spindle so I could apply them. I tried a lot of different things and a few of them were headaches. So this has been the easiest for me. Um, so this is a spindle cape. It, this one's made by Dan Tracy Designs. I like that I can store my spindles on it when I want to. And otherwise, what you do is you would put, mm -hmm, boop, your spindle. That one right onto here. It has this tensioning hook, which you can move to where you need it. You would feed your yarn through here. And again, then you would just drag it over to your bobbin winder with your bobbin and it holds it steady, lets it twirl while you transfer everything over, which then looks like this. I have to block myself where it likes to focus. So that is my favorite way to transfer. And then, and the reason I love that is because then what I do is I end up with a bunch of these and I'll just have a basket for them or if they have to be in a specific order, I line them up. But these all fit on my Lazy Kate. So I just put it on, ply, one runs out, I put a new one on and I keep going. Especially when I'm doing like right now, this is a sweater spin I'm working on on my spindles. It is going to be a doozy. So I love that as I'm plying, I can just go straight from these. What's nice too and just like a little bonus tip, one of the things that is nice about using weaving bobbins, I've seen a lot of spinners do this even when they are wheel spinning, they will actually transfer from their big wheel bobbins down onto weaving bobbins to mix them all up when they're doing a sweater spin to end up with a more consistent yarn because we're gonna vary a little bit as we're spinning. So, I don't love that that's in there. Um, <laughs> So when you do smaller portions from all over that whole time you were spinning and spin them up randomly, ply them up randomly, it's going to end up with a more consistent result because you're mixing it all up. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. This was another one about plying singles. So I thought I would just do them back to back. Um, when plying singles, do you have to draft the singles the same way? Do they have to be spun on the same spindle style? Or could I apply singles spun on a drop spindle with a single on a supported spindle? Oh, I had read that differently when I first picked it and now I'm realizing what it actually says. Okay, so when you are applying your singles, when you say you do you draft them the same way, um, I'm not sure exactly what that question means. As far as the, I mean, I only, when I think of drafting, I think of two things. The direction that the spin is going to be and what I'm doing with my hands. As far as what I'm doing with my hands, whether I have done um, worsted or woolen style drafting with the fiber to begin with, I am always doing the same motion when I'm plying, which is I'm letting the singles run through my fingers in one hand, and then the other hand is watching how much twist is going in and directing it to the orifice. Um, or, yeah, if you're using a drop spindle, it's that same thing. So, again, I haven't plied on a support spindle, so I'm only going to talk about what I know. 
So on a drop spindle, I would give it a twist and let that twist run in and then wrap it around my cop and go on putting in a twist. So I don't change that motion, but you absolutely do change the direction in which you are adding twist. So I, all my singles, I always, I'm always going to forget if it's S or Z. I always twist clockwise. So my wheel or my spindle, whatever I'm using, either the wheel or the spindle is going to the right, like you're reading a clock. Then when I go to ply, I go the opposite way because you have to balance out the twist you put in. If you try to ply in the same direction that you twisted your singles, they're going to be so over twisted, they're gonna be a coil, they're gonna be a pigtail, they're gonna be rope. So you wanna go the other direction to help balance out the twist you put in, which will hopefully end up with a yarn that hangs straight when it's just hanging loose. So I always ply counterclockwise. So where's a pen? I know all of you are screaming at me. There's a pen right next to you. <laughs> I do it every time. All right, let's see S and Z. I just, I don't know why I can't get that in my head. I mean, S is going... I'm not even, I'm not even gonna mess with it. You know, if you are an S or a Z twist person, you know which way I'm talking about. For the rest of us, I'm gonna say clockwise or counterclockwise. So, singles clockwise, plying counterclockwise. You don't have to do it that way. That's just the way I do it. And some people even go into learning, okay, it depends if I'm going to knit with it or weave with it or crochet with it. And then they might change up how they do things. I don't trust myself. So I would end up messing everything up if I tried to bounce around. So it's just safer for me to always do my singles, twist into the right, going clockwise, and always doing my plying counterclockwise. Um, and could I ply single spun on a drop spindle with a single on a supported spindle? Sure, why not? I mean, technically most people I, I always hate to stereotype how one might be spinning on a certain tool. I'll, so I'll talk about me again. When I spin on a drop spindle, I am doing a worsted style draft, like a pinch like this, like an inchworm. When I am spinning on a supported spindle, I am doing long draw. So I'm doing a woolen style draft. So if it were me, would I combine? Maybe not because I've spun them very differently. I have one that's full of air. It's got a different twist. You know, it might be a little lighter. Um, I have one that's really smoothed out, has more of a sheen, etc. So experiment, try it out, see if you like that or there's the information for you. If you spin similar to me, where maybe you choose a worsted draft for a drop spindle and a woolen draft for a support, maybe you wanna just keep those two separately. But there's no reason why you can't try it. Experiment. Okay, back to knitting for the last question of the day. Do you have tips for working color work flat? I've done some searching and found useful info on keeping the yarn turning points neat but I haven't seen anything on color dominance. When working on the wrong side, do we need to change how we're holding the yarns? Is there anything else to watch out for? So, I personally still hold, so I knit my color work two-handed, and I always keep my dominant yarn. So you're going to have a dominant yarn and a background yarn. I, to, if it's helpful, the dominant yarn is the one we're making the picture out of. It's the motif yarn. The background yarn is just how it sounds. It's the background. It's your main color typically. Um, and it just makes the backdrop of what you're knitting. So we want the dominant yarn, the yarn that's making the motif or the design to pop. And to make it pop, we kind of want to help push it. So to do that, in general, you if you knit two-handed like I do for stranded color work, I always keep the dominant yarn in my left hand, regardless of if I'm on the right or wrong side of my work. But I think the most important 
piece is that we always want to strand the dominant color below the background color. So hopefully that makes sense. So what we're trying to do is keep the float of the dominant color below the float of, I mean, I'm doing this, the flow of the background color. So if these were my floats, I, I did my nails perfectly. I didn't even know I was going to. These were the floats. And this is my dominant color. The red's my dominant color. The blue sagey color is my background color. I want my background color to be going along the top of the float of my dominant color. And that doesn't change whether you're on the right side or the wrong side. Besides that, the only other tips I have are the same one that I've get, I've even done a little video for it, but it's basically just, I always keep my stitches on my right hand needle spread out and that's to help keep my floats the right length. Um, because if your stitches are all smooshed together, sometimes your floats can get too short and we don't want our floats to get too short because if your floats are a little too long, over time, generally our stranded color work, as we wash and block it, everything's going to zhuzh into place. It's going to be fine. But if they're too short, that yarn can only stretch too much. And then you might end up with like puckered color work. Also, the last thing I would say is just remember not to judge your color work before you've blocked it. Like right now I'm working on a color work cowl and it kind of looks like a hot mess, but I know once I block it, it all looks beautiful. Um, so be gentle with yourself. A lot of people don't love pearling color work. Um, I don't tend to mind it just because I know that I have a relief row every other row on the knit side. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if anybody else has any working color work flat tips, please let us know. I mean, you always have the option. In most knits, you could throw in a steep column so you can stay working in the round and you could cut it open afterward. There are times I don't love doing that. Like, I don't love doing a steak for armholes just because I don't love the bulk of the steak near the armhole. But I know plenty of people who do not mind that and they would much rather that than work back and forth for a yoke. So, um, you know, that's the beautiful thing about knitting is we can learn different techniques and styles that can help us make it the most joyful experience for what we love and what we're comfortable with. Um, but yeah, if anybody else has any other tips on working stranded flat, please share them below. If you're better at explaining color dominance, feel free to chime in. I always feel like I'm floundering there. I, I'm always afraid my brain's going to switch it as I try to say it out loud. Um, there are definitely loads of blog posts and things out there about color dominance. Um, so it's really interesting if you don't know what I'm talking about and you're like, what is, what is color dominance? Um, what's really fun is most of those blog posts will show you where they held that contrast color dominant and where they didn't and what a difference it makes. So it really gives you sharper, um, more popping stranded color work when you pay attention to your dominance. So it's pretty interesting. All right. That is it for questions. And I did have, I, okay, I have a little show and tell, not much. Um, I'm working on, I've, I'm finishing up loads, loads of knits, y'all. I'm really excited. I can't wait to share them with you, but it's not quite time. So I did just finish this spin, which is pretty fun. I've shown y'all a couple times. I've been working on a spin from Ingle Nook with their stickle bats. And last week I finally finished up, I'm doing a three ply. So I have two other sets of this. And what's fun though, is with this final set, I took each color and I passed it through my drum carter twice to better blend them. So to give you an example. So what I'm hoping is this one ply will kind of bring this cohesion to the other two, which I left natural. So, so that you can see these. This is what it looks like not blended, and this is what it looks like blended. So anyways, I'm very excited to see how that turns out. I won't have time to apply it for a few more days, but it can rest while I wait. And then this is so fun, so I wanted to show you. Melly Knits. If you don't know who Melly Knits is, she is 
this amazing hand processor, fiber fleece hand processor. Um, she sells bats. I've shown them. This is, this is just a single breed. This is the sweater quantity I'm working on. This is from her bats. So they're really, really lovely for long draw or on a wheel or support spindles. I love using them for support spindles. I've shown y'all some other things I've done on here. But anyway, she has this new thing she's doing called Guts. And she sends you the washed fleece. Because I think I've realized, I don't know that washing fleece is really something I'm cut out for. <laughs> I washed my whole fleece from Rhinebeck and I'm like, I don't know about this. I don't think I did it enough. I think I'm gonna have to do it again. Life's too short. <laughs> But anyways, so what's really fun about this and why I wanted to share it is because it comes with this sorry silk and this is the one I got is Shetland. This is Viola. And so this is all washed and then I have the recycled sorry silk and I'm going to make my own bat on my drum carter. I'm so excited. It's like she did the work for me. I know I just get to go do the fun part and then spin it up. So anyways, I am very excited to give it a go. Maybe if I find time between all these crazy projects I'm working on, maybe um, I'll be able to show it to you next week. No promises. It might be more than next week, but I'll try my best. So anyways, that's kind of fun. If you don't know who Melly Knits is, her she's Melly Knits on Instagram. Her stories are awesome because she talks all about washing fleece and... All kinds of good stuff um, but I will link I'll link her below so you can find it I will link the spindle cape below and do I have any other show and tell I think that's kind of it because my knits are secret I'll be showing them to you soon though so all right I hope you have a great weekend thanks for spending some time with me I hope to see you back here next week if you want to ask a question you can find a link for that at the very bottom of the show notes just click the show description below this video and have a great weekend. Happy making. Bye.